Last couple of weeks, we were looking at uh, the seven parts of Jesus being the way to eternal life. We saw that in these areas, the way of suffering, obedience, holiness, love, peace, faithfulness, and victory, Jesus led the way, led by example. He explained that we were going to have to do the same things, and we've been given the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to help us accomplish these things. This morning, I'd like to take a look at some scriptures about what God's expectation of the church is and what we will receive as we labor in his vineyard on the way of Christ. First off, not everyone is going to get the same amount of work to receive the same reward, so I thought I'd just knock this out first. That's up to God, and he determines our wages. Matthew chapter 20, we're going to have to read a few verses, and uh, I realize that, I don't know, we may not be able to schedule DJ's stewardship meditation the same time that Steve is here. <laughs> but as long as I'm here, we'll be able to get through the third hour. <laughs> That was an encouragement, DJ. It didn't seem like it may be up here, but the rest of us know. I'm trying to be an encouragement. You're almost ready for second hour. I can, I can feel it coming. Okay, Matthew 20, and we're going to read about 16 verses here. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. But he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. So when the evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those who were hired about the eleventh hour... They each received a denarius, but when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last, for many are called, but few chosen. <coughs> so, I mean, if somebody were going to complain about how long that they had to serve the Lord before they received their reward, Frank might be at the top of the list. Okay, He just might be there. He would have a complaint if after all these years he receives his reward and somebody comes along after only being a Christian for a week and he turns to the Lord and says, well, wow, is that fair? But the Lord is fair. So I just wanted to eliminate that whole thing about this labor and the way on uh, walking on the way of Christ. Jesus had a more exacting picture of this vineyard and how it's going to apply to us and our laborers in John 15. John 15, which Corey kept trying to bring up in the first hour class, and I kept trying to get him to back off because he was going to take all the wind out of my sails. But we were going over this a little bit this morning. John 15, starting in verse 1, it says, Speak, Jesus speaking, he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. 
You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch, and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. We are going to be producing fruit as we travel on this way of Christ. First thing to notice, it's not something that we generate on our own. It is a result of abiding in Christ and he in us. The bearing of spiritual fruit is one of the methods that we know that we are on the right path. It's like when you do your self-examination of your walk. If you start seeing spiritual fruit in your life, Oh, there's a hint, pilgrim, you're on the right path. You cannot bear this fruit on your own. It comes as a result of abiding in Christ. <clears throat> Just as we hope that the Lord is patient with us while we bear some fruit, or until we bear some fruit, we also need to be patient for him to reward us with our wages. James 5 and 7 reminds us, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. A reminder for us, it's not going to come exactly when we think it's going to come. It's going to come in the Lord's time. Back to John 15, 1. Jesus is the vine, not us. We are the branches that grow out of the vine. If we don't abide in Christ, live, dwell in, draw our nourishment from him, we will not bear fruit. If we do abide in him, we cannot help but bear fruit. You're not going to be able to stop it. It's going to be a natural result of abiding in Christ. Notice that verse 8 says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So there's the expectation that we will bear fruit, and it is what's going to glorify God. <clears throat> The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, had this encouragement for them. In Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 9, it says, For this reason, we also, since the day that we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. That was Paul's prayer for them. Being fruitful in good works and abiding more in the word of God, which makes you more fruitful, which is more evidence that you're on the right path. So it's for your benefit. The Apostle James even takes this a step further to help us see that our fruits need to be pure and not mixed with the carnal attitudes and desires of the earth. In James chapter 3, picking up in about verse 11, he has an interesting comment here. Most of us can grip this. Picking up in verse 11, it says, Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. <clears throat> Who is wise in understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. 
But if you have bitter envy, and notice this, and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. It's interesting that DJ Stewardship would be bringing up this individual that was sharing the word only for his own profit. It is still happening to this day. And even our good works need to be done out of a pure intention and not looking to receive the praise of men. <clears throat> is it possible to perform good works and not be the fruit of the Spirit? Yes. There are the New Testaments of Ananias and Sapphira as witness. They appeared to be producing the fruit of good works by selling the property and giving the proceeds to the apostles. But it was not with an honest heart. They were seeking the glory of men and paid for it with their lives. The Apostle Paul was also very concerned by the, for the church in Philippi and encouraged them in Philippians 1, 9 through 11, where he said, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and the praise of God. Romans chapter 7. Paul, writing unto the church in Rome, explains that holiness is a fruit from righteousness, <clears throat> starting in verse 19, 719, I think. Somehow that doesn't look right. All right, I'll have to get back to you on that. Six? Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Aunt Sue. Romans 6, 19. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of unrighteousness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were freed in regard to righteousness. But what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's also the fruit of giving that Paul writes to the Philippians about. Philippians chapter 4, picking up in about verse 14. <clears throat> Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Paul was not so much interested in the gift as he was interested in the fruit that was going to abound to their account, their heavenly reward for their earthly sacrifice. For the young people, next week, 
Philippians, note to self. Okay? <clears throat> let us not forget Hebrews 13, 15, 16. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. And we can't leave the subject of the fruit without going to Galatians 5 and 22. Galatians 5 and 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Nine more fruits that we can look for in our lives to confirm that we are still on the way of Christ. Remember, as we walk on this journey, God is the husbandman. He's coming to the vine, which is Christ, and he's looking at the branches, which are us, and he's looking for fruits. This is what they are. These are the things that are going to appear in your life. Now, for me, I think it's much more obvious because I was sort of a, a serious individual, very focused. And now I'm trying to be much more open. I'll give you a perfect example. None of the Olmstead kids were ever picked up and carried around by me. Now you do that. Now I do that. Is that not awesome? Parker, just have to, you have to ruin the moment, don't you, Parker? I'm talking about the little ones. I'm talking about the little ones. Dan and Olivia's, Jesse, Taylor, and Corey's, Sophia. I carry kids around. Haven't you noticed that? No. I'm going out of my way to do that. I'm not even being appreciated now. And this is one of the fruits. Okay. Um, it, it's just not enough. I, I can see this. All gone. I am trying to have these fruits in my life, and you're supposed to be encouraging me. The Lord knows I'm progressing. Obviously, some of you aren't seeing my progress. But I'm seeing my progress, and that's the important part. Exactly. But maybe you aren't seeing some progress. Well, you know, you're probably progressing and not knowing it. I'm a little sorry that Lana's not here, because Lana has encouraged me by telling me over the last couple of weeks that she is now starting to see things differently and growing in the knowledge of the Lord. She's recognizing that she's getting some of these fruits. So maybe, you know, you're not seeing anything. Well, that's not too abnormal. Maybe when you were younger and you were growing, you didn't feel like you were growing, but you were physically growing. And you didn't really notice it until what happened. Maybe the parent grabbed you and slammed you up against the door jam and took a pencil and marked how tall you were. Or all of a sudden, maybe you looked down and somebody else in your family was shorter than you remember them being. And then you started thinking, well, maybe I'm growing. Who knows? You are growing. In some cases, others will tell you that you are changing, and sometimes you will not realize that you, or sometimes you may realize that you're not responding to this life's issues the same way that you used to, such as slamming them into the door jam and getting their measurement against their will. Now maybe you ask them kindly, please step over by the door jam, I'd like to see how much you're growing. How about from the spiritual sense? 
you know, nobody's slam dunking you for failing to grow. And if they are, maybe they're asking you kindly. I don't know. It's all up to you. Maybe you're finding yourself to be more concerned and compassionate about others and their needs. Maybe you're getting out of your comfort zone and going to see somebody to talk them or call them on the phone if they're going through a trial or tribulation. And that's not something that you would have done in the past. Maybe. Maybe you're more interested in helping others than yourself now. Those are just some of the examples of how you can see your spiritual growth in the Lord and bearing the fruits that God wants you to bear. How long does it take for a Christian to bear fruit? Well, you know, that's kind of an individual thing, I believe, and each one is going to have a, a different amount of fruit at any given time. Until they come to the perfect man, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, and then you're going to have all the fruit. Now, I took a moment to look up fruit growing because, you know, those examples are used throughout the Bible about the need for the fig tree to have fruit or you know, whatever. The, there's an expectation there. We're going to look at some of those expectations here in a moment. And just because I didn't know, and I'll share this with you, maybe everybody knows it but me, did you know a dwarf apple tree can bear fruit in two to four years. And if you get the semi-dwarf apple tree, it's three to six. But the standard seedling from an apple tree, where you get the little twig and you stick it in the ground, is six to 10 years for an apple tree to bear fruit. Which made me think, well, how about things that were mentioned in the scripture, such as vines, grapevines? A grapevine produces in three years. A fig tree in three to five years. If it's from a cutting, meaning you know, if they cut the twig from a, a current one and planted it in the ground three to five years. And a pear or peach tree, depending on the model, three to five years. So now you young Christians are thinking, let's see, I've been a Christian less than a year. I ain't got to do anything for a couple more years. <laughs> and I wouldn't go there, Pilgrim. I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't take a chance on that. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. I'm going to read about seven verses here. And this is how the Lord is looking at his vineyard. Starting in verse 1. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Not a very pretty picture, but it's abundantly clear. If the Lord's not getting the fruit that he expects to get, the vineyard's going to get destroyed. Jesus also left us a parable to consider in Luke chapter 13, picking up in verse 6. It says, he also spake this parable. 
a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. There's a need for the fruit to be born. And it's going to be up to you and your walk with the Lord on his way and the Holy Spirit working within you and the word of God to generate this fruit. This way of Christ will not always be easy. As a matter of fact, the more you resist, the more difficult it gets. If we accept the need to walk as Christ walked, then we will have to suffer, be obedient and holy, to love as Jesus loved, to be at peace with others, to be faithful in our walk so that we can reap the victory. The more we abide in Christ in his way, the more we will change. As we change, we will begin to bear the fruits of the Spirit. That is what God intended for us. Sure, there's going to be some pruning, and we're going to have to endure it. But it will be for our good in the long run. The fruits of the Spirit are not painful. They are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. They are also good works, righteousness, holiness, giving of our resources, and the praises of our lips. We have a need to bear the fruit so that God can be glorified, because that's what fruit does. It glorifies God. And he does it in our lives and the things that we say and the things that we do and how we live our lives. I hope that you've been encouraged by this message, looking at the way of Christ and the things that are required, and the end result is the changing of our lives and the bearing of fruits for others, not just for yourself. Thanks for your attention. We will be dismissed by Brother Jerry with a word of prayer, please.